If you'll permit me, said the stranger, I'd like to tell you a story. After all, it's a long journey, and by the look of those skies, we're not going to be leaving the carriage for some time. So why not pass the hours of some storytelling? The perfect thing for a late October evening. Are you quite comfortable there? Don't worry about Herbert, he won't hurt you. It's just this weather makes him nervous. Now, where was I? What about some brandy to keep the chill out? You don't mind a hip flask, do you? Well, this is a story that actually happened. Those are the best kind, don't you think? Hi, and welcome to So Many Books, So Little Time podcast. My name is Jody Stapler. I'm an owner of a publishing company called Willow Moon Publishing, a podcaster, a voiceover artist, and an author. Stories are so important in our lives. And there are so many out there from independent authors and independent publishing companies that we may never find unless we trip over them on accident. So I started this podcast for people who love books and love to read and to help bring more awareness to the indie books and authors of our time. So stay with me for so many books, so little time. I am speaking with the author that everyone knows as Ellie Griffiths. Of course, her first name is Domenica De Rosa, and she is a crime novelist of two series, the Ruth Galloway series and the Magic Men mystery series. But she has written a standalone novel that is ju- is about to come out, and it is awesome. It's The Stranger <laughs> Diaries. So thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you very much for asking me. Absolutely. It's, you know, I'm not normally, I love to watch mysteries, but they scare me. So I don't usually (laughs) read them. Um, So this is definitely one that I I couldn't read before bedtime, but (laughs) it is a very cool, spooky mystery, even some ghost story in there. Well, yes, I I did want to make it, I suppose I wanted to make it just scary enough, if you know what I mean. I yeah. wanted to make it so as it was a little bit creepy, a little bit gothic, although it's it's set in modern times, although yeah. there's a kind of Victorian story that runs through it. Um, you know, that made it a little bit but but not sort of really I, I never do sort of gore or anything like that, not too full on horror. But I did right. I wanted it to be creepy. I think that's just what I wanted. Yeah, absolutely. So can you tell our uh listeners a little bit about the story, kind of the the basis of it? Well, it's set, um, it, it starts off in a, a school, a modern school, uh, um, a non-fee paying school, ordinary school in Sussex. But the school is in a building that was once owned by a, a Victorian short story writer who was famous for a ghost story called The Stranger. Um, and the story actually starts with a little bit from, from this story called The Stranger, which is about a man on the train. And the woman who's, who's, uh, telling us about the story is teaching it. She's a teacher and she teaches creative writing. But then she hears that one of her colleagues has been killed. Um, and she writes about this this uh, death in her diary. And then to her horror, she finds that someone else is writing in her diary and that somebody could well be the killer. And it's told in sort of three voices. I wanted to do that sort of a bit like sort of Wilkie Collins and those sort of writers that have different narrators. So it's partly narrated by the teacher, Claire, partly by the detective, who's a woman called Harbinder Singh, and partly by Claire's daughter, Georgia, who has her own secrets. Yeah, and that part where she realizes someone else is writing in her journal, <laughs> it was like my my heart just like dropped, like, oh my gosh, that's scary. Um, yeah, so it's a very cool, cool story. And what's really neat is that you kind of weave another book throughout the book. Yes, yes. I, well, I... um. I, I was, I did really enjoy doing that bit, I have to say, yes. So I kind of made up this story that's meant to be the story by R.M. Holland. And a couple of people have got in, in, in England, the book's out already. And people have contacted me saying, well, where can I find, you know, R.M. Holland's book? Yeah. Sorry. So I took that as a big compliment that they thought that he really existed. Um, Absolutely. And I actually <laughs> researched that to see if he was oh, a real I'm so author. I'm glad. I'm so glad. Um, I mean, obviously, he owes a bit to people like sort of M.R. James and those sort of creepy Victorian writers. But um, I do really like telling ghost stories. I have to say, I don't know if this is a very good character trait, but when my children were growing up, I loved telling them quite scary stories. And I remember that <laughs> one of their friends, I told, I had, they had, they had some friends around for Halloween and I told this story. 
And one little girl, she, her mother told me rather crossly, actually, she didn't sleep for a week. So I was very oh, no. sorry, you know. I felt very bad that I sort of gone over the, the line into nice, caring mum telling stories into really scary ghost lady. Um, but yeah. I do, yeah, I do, I do quite like telling ghost stories. Yeah. Now, where do you get the inspiration? Go ahead. I, I was going to say, I think it's, it's possibly quite um, a sort of uh, atavistic, quite a, a thing in humankind that we like to tell those sort of stories. I'm That's sure we've true. told them for a long time. I was just going to say that it was... Um, the story was partly inspired by a place where I teach, actually. I teach creative writing in an old, um, uh, it's a stately home in the, in the, in the West, in West Sussex countryside, very much where the story is set. And it was owned by a guy who was very involved in the, was an art patron, very involved in surrealist art. So you've got this strange surreal art around the place. And the, this, the staircase in the book, there's a spiral staircase with footprints imprinted on it. That's actually in the house. So that was one of the, the inspirations. Very cool. I was going to ask you what your inspiration was. Um, so I, I did read that when you were younger, you actually in, in high school, I guess, secondary school, um, you used to write your own episodes of like Starsky and Hutch. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I was a big Starsky and Hutch fan when I was young. And I did. I used to write little episodes um, of Starsky and Hutch. And I nearly always used to kill one of them. It's becoming clear while we've been talking that, you know, not only do I like scaring people, I like upsetting people. So I, I wrote these little stories. I nearly always killed Starsky or Hutch. And I do oh remember because they'd be, I'd take them into school and they'd be passed around in class and people would read them. And they used to cry. People used to cry. And I do remember, I have to say, quite liking that. Or, or right. you know, just thinking, wasn't it so strange that, you know, the order in which you put words on the page, it could make people cry. And of course, it could make them laugh as well. And I, I just remember that had quite a big effect on me. So, yes, really, my writing career, I did write um, a, a, a sort of mystery novel when I was 11. That was the first sort of thing I wrote. But then it did go on with the Starsky and Hutch fan fiction, I suppose you'd call it now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's amazing that you would get... um kids of that age into the story that much that they would be willing yes. to just cry over it so that tells you what a great writer you are oh well thank you thank you i i i certainly had had worked out a way to to get their emotions i do think i i had worked that out at that point yeah so if you started writing and you said you wrote one at 11 when did you really start and know that you wanted to be a writer when you grew up well, I suppose I had always wanted to be a writer. If you'd asked me, even before I started school, I used to, even before I could probably write, I used to make these little books and things. So I was kind of always wanted to be a writer all the way through school. And I kind of did all the right things, I suppose. I read English at university. After university, I worked in library for a while. And then I worked in a publishing company for HarperCollins. And I loved that. But in a way, it sort of, I don't know, put me off writing in a weird way. I suppose that a lot of my sort of creative side was, was tied up with, with being an editor. I was an editor with editing, with mm. other people's books, which I loved. But it wasn't until I went on maternity leave and I have twins who are 20 now. So it's 20, wow. 21 years ago. Then I, um, I, I suppose I realized I had a bit more time and I thought, Oh, you know, what I actually wanted to do is write my own stuff. So I started a book, uh, that became my first published book. And it was actually published under my real name, as you said earlier, as Domenica de Rosa. And it was called The Italian Quarter. And it was based on my dad's experiences as an Italian immigrant in the, um, in the war. That's amazing. And so what made you decide then to become Ellie Griffiths? Well, what it was, was so after I'd written The Italian Quarter, and obviously it took me a lot longer than, you know, my maternity leave to write it and to get a publisher and all those things. But eventually I, I did get an agent and a publisher. And I published another three books, all sort of, I don't like the phrase, but they're of course of women's fiction, you know, they're sort of about relationships and, and place and a bit about history. Um, and then um, I suppose what really uh, inspired the change was that my husband, Andy, uh, he'd been a lawyer mm. when I met him. He suddenly, well, not that suddenly, because I had known that it might happen, decided to change career and become an archaeologist. Um, wow. You know, something he'd always wanted to do. <laughs> uh, it was a bit of a shock. I had to remind myself of something Agatha Christie said, apparently. She said, it's a good thing to be married to an archaeologist, 
because they only get more interested in you as you get older. <laughs> so <I guess laughs> very true. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, so he went back to university and became an archaeologist. And I suppose I just became very interested in that. And um, I remember one day we were walking with, with our kids who were quite young then across the marshland in Norfolk. And Andy said that, um, mentioned that prehistoric people had thought that marshland was sacred because it's neither land nor sea, but something in between. They thought right. of it as a kind of bridge to the afterlife, you know, neither land nor sea, neither life nor death, a kind of in-between place, a liminal zone. And that's wow, where yeah. you find bodies buried there, you know, the so-called bog bodies. Yeah. And like the bottom, just, but yeah. just a sort of, yes, exactly. Some, a sort of fire lit in my, my brain. And I immediately thought of the story of the crossing places, which is the first Ruth book. And, and it was like I saw Ruth sort of walking towards me out of the mist. And that's never really happened to me before or since. I sort of knew her immediately. So I sat down and wrote the book, but right up to that point, I hadn't really thought of it as a different genre, you know, because it had a lot of the same things that my other books had. It had, you know, strong sense of place and female main character and all that. But when I showed it to my agent, she said, oh, she said, oh, this is crime. You need a crime name. So, mm. so and I think her thinking was that Domenica de Rosa is, um, well, for one thing, it does sound made up, which is weird because it's my real name. <laughs> but, also, right. but also, it's very romantic, isn't it? It's like a romantic yes, it novelist is. name. And I, yeah. I think she thought it just wasn't gritty enough. So, I chose Ellie Griffiths because it was my grandmother's name. She was Ellen Oh, very Griffiths, nice. So I, I thought I'd choose her name. Very nice. That's awesome. I'm glad that it's not just like a made-up name that you actually had family members with no, that. No, it's, that's, it's that's nice great. that it's still a family name. And my, my grandma, I didn't know her very well. She died when I was five. But one of the things people often said about her was that she was a very, very clever woman. She loved reading. She loved books. But she'd had to leave school at 13 and become a servant. So she mm. really, I think she would really like to see her name on a book. That's yeah, what, what a great have. way to memorialize her. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, so now this one is a standalone novel, although I have to say I could see <laughs> you writing series with it. Um, why did you decide to just make it a standalone? Well, I'd written uh, 10 books in the Ruth Galloway series. So the 10th one was uh, The Dark Angel. And I'd always thought there would be just 10 books in the series, although I have to tell you, I've written number 11 now, and it'll be out <laughs> in the States later on this year. Wow. So there are going to be more. But at that point, I think I just sort of wanted a bit of um, a break and a bit of a change. Um, and I'd had this story sort of, you know, bubbling away in the background for a while. And there was a day, do you, did you have that um, in the States, the day when the sky went all yellow? Because there no. were, it, it was to do with... What was it to do with an ash cloud, I think, in, 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 in Norway? Oh, or I remember the news talking about that. Yes, yeah, but no, we didn't have really it. It was really weird. A bit like the red sky you had the other night in New York. And yeah. it, you know, that sort of thing where you think, oh, this is so spooky. And that yeah. day, I, I, I suddenly thought of the way to start The Stranger Diaries with, with the, with the actual, uh, story, The Stranger. So I sort of started to write it down. Um, so I wanted it to be a standalone, I suppose, because I was thinking, then in a way it would just give me freedom. I could write anything I liked. But um mm. and it was very liberating. But I have to say, I have since slightly wanted to write more about Harbinder, who is the, the yeah. peace woman in it. Yeah. That's so exactly who I thought would be. A, right. Oh, I good, think good. she would be a great character to keep going. Absolutely. Oh good. Um, one of the great things about this story is that, okay, so Claire is the teacher and she keeps a journal, as you said, and you really kind of get to know her by reading the lines <laughs> of what she writes in the journal. Um, but she's also very much into this R.M. Holland, and she's teaching him and the, this author who wrote The Stranger. And when her colleague is found dead, one of the lines from his book that she is always talking about is next to the body, which is, hell is empty. Yes. And it's it's such um, I don't know it's kind of even a spooky sentence. So where did you get this? Where where inside you do you have this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm my my kids were actually doing A level uh, English at the time, and they were studying the Tempest, and it's a line from the Tempest. And I okay. don't think you think one thinks of the Tempest as being no. a very scary play, but there is this very frightening line in it: "Hell is empty, and all the devils are here." Um, and I thought it would be good to have it because 
Near, so many um, English students uh, study The Tempest, and of course, Claire yeah. is an English teacher. So that that meant that the suspicion, uh, you know, pointed a bit towards her and her colleagues because um, she's got some slightly strange colleagues. Um, and also, it fitted well because this line obviously occurs in in the st- short story, uh, The Stranger. So I I just love you know. I, I, th- there are some wonderful lines in 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 Shakespeare. The, the lines that I always used, I always think have got about ten um, mystery titles in them are "The Sleeping and the Dead Are But as Pictures." It is the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. And that's from mm. Macbeth. But just in those two lines, there are about ten. You know, "The Sleeping and the Dead." I'm sure it's been used before. Painted devil, eye of childhood. There's so much in there, isn't there? It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, you've got the brain of a genius. Oh no! <laughs> to to, to be, see to hear those lines and to picture and lines. <laughs> yeah, to to be able to come up with so many other things and to think that it's just amazing. It's so impressive. Oh well, I I you know if you were to ask any of my family whether I had a good memory, they'd say no because I'm always forgetting like appointments and t- telephone numbers <laughs> and stuff. But I that is the thing that I do have quite a good memory for lines and for um for poetry and anything that i've read or that i've seen that i've studied it does stay there and sort of go round in my head and and i think that is quite a quite an advantage for a writer absolutely now and it's obviously been working for you for sure um <laughs> with your writing um now you seem to have this um a lot of detectives in your books and do you find yourself to be that kind of person? Do you do you research people and things like that? Like, are you someone that's going to go online if there's someone new in one of your daughter's lives and and do detective work? <laughs> uh, no, no, I must admit, I'm I'm quite good about not doing that in their that's their good. private lives. But um, I do like a mystery. I do like solving. Uh, and I like you know, I'm like a lot of us. I like crosswords I like puzzles you know I I I love you know watching a nice poirot on television and trying to work it out although it, occasionally that does because I also of course remember who did it in most of them but in a couple of recent adaptations they've changed who did it which made me look mm. very silly when I was telling the whole family yeah. I know who did it. but <laughs> but I do like um you know I do like mysteries and I do like I do like that sort of uh, you know solving something I I you know especially if the clue, as it often is in in Agatha Christie or something, is maybe something that, that that's a word or a phrase or something. I particularly yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I really love about this story because, like you said, there's not the gore. It's more of a thought provoking story where you have to really kind of read between the lines and figure things out. Because as Claire is kind of considered the murderer in the beginning or you're kind of thinking was it her yes then you find yes. out this journal has been written in by someone else which then makes you worry about claire so that yes. i love that i love that oh good i'm so glad yes and so now do you feel like you might go with a second one or a third one with the detective I think I would definitely like to write another standalone. I found it such a invigorating, liberating process, really, because I love okay. writing about Ruth, you know, and I love Ruth. But of course, when you have a character that people know so well, you can't right. do exactly what you described just then, where you think, oh, is it Claire? Or is Claire in danger? Or I don't know about Claire. Whereas, of course, people know Ruth so well, you can't really do that with Ruth. So I did really enjoy that. So I will definitely write another standalone. And I think... Uh, Harbinder, the detective, might come into it because I found her a really fun character to write about. She's this kind of sparky, she's a local girl. Um, but, you know, for, for other ways, she feels she doesn't quite fit in. She's Sikh, she's gay, she's very sort of, um, I suppose, sort of spiky personality. So I, I would like to write more about her. Yeah, that would be awesome. I would love that. And then, of course, oh, Georgia good. is an interesting character um, with her connections with white witches. Yes. Well, I particularly <laughs> wanted with Georgia, I feel very strongly that teenagers get a very bad press. I really do. It feels like, it feels like teenagers are now the only bit of society that we can all sneer at and all laugh at. And, you know, it, you know, people are often saying, Oh, you know, they're always on their phones. They're always this. They're always that. 
But in my experience, and I've, uh, my, my children are not teenagers anymore, but they, they were teenagers very right. recently. Um, you know, actually, it's probably women my age who are on their phone the most and who certainly who like things like Facebook and things the most. I, mm-hmm. You know, my kids don't, don't do any of that social media stuff, but they do go on their phones quite often. And what they're doing, of course, is writing. You know, mm, they're, they're yeah. journaling in a way and in the way that Claire, you know, like me, I keep a diary, sort of sits down with her journal and her pen and writes. Well, Georgia is doing the same thing. She's got an online diary. And I wanted to, to have it that it was very easy for, for Claire, although she's a very loving mother, to think, oh, Georgia's on her phone. She's probably on Facebook. She's probably playing a game. Actually, Georgia is is writing her her diaries. Uh, uh, online and you know that yeah. might bring her into danger so I wanted to add that sort of element and also to just have a teenage character that had some depth I hope she has some depth that people don't necessarily see oh definitely I definitely know girls like Georgia so or I've met oh, them good. yeah yeah so she definitely seems like a real person um which is awesome oh, good. yeah and I do love that you have the three female characters you kind of get um, each of their sides throughout the book. And like I said, it's just a spooky mystery that reminds you of like an Agatha Christie. So for oh, people good. who I'm love that glad. kind of story, yeah, they should really go out and get this book. I hope it's, you know, a bit like the sort of cozy, pull the curtains, you know, put another log on the fire. And it's that, I hope it's that sort of feeling, you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So can people find you online or in social media? Yes, sure. Yes, um, I've uh, got an Ellie Griffiths Facebook page. I'm Ellie Griffiths on Twitter and on Instagram. And I absolutely love to hear from people. So please do get in touch. Oh, perfect. And do you, are you doing any kind of book tours or anything like that? Are you coming over to the States at all? Well, I hope to come over. I was actually over last year. I was in Florida for Bouchercon, which, you know, is the big crime writing festival. And that was in um, St. Petersburg, Florida, which was so beautiful and lovely. And I did, I was so lucky because I did a little tour afterwards with two other writers that we didn't know before, but who are now really firm friends, uh, Amy Stewart and Mario Giordano. And all we had in common was that we had the same um, American publisher. But we went on this kind of road trip together. And we had so much fun. I can't tell you. It was really great. So I'm hoping to meet up with them at some point. So I haven't necessarily got anything planned for this year, but in 2020, I will definitely be over in the States and we'll be doing some touring. I want to thank Ellie Griffiths, also known as Domenica De Rosa, for joining me today and talking to me about her mystery novel, The Stranger Diaries. What an awesome read. And I want to thank you for joining me on So Many Books, So Little Time. Let me know what books you're reading, what authors I should interview, and give me your suggestions and comments. If you appreciate our podcasts, books, music, and our goal of helping others fulfill their artistic career dreams, and would like to see it continue for many years to come, please join our Patreon and become a sponsor at Willow Moon Publishing. Make sure you subscribe to So Many Books, So Little Time podcast so that others can find me and all the great indie books and authors that I'll be sharing throughout this podcast. You can join me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at So Many Books, So Little Time podcast. And you can check my website out at jodystapler.com or email us at so many books podcast at gmail.com. Thank you for joining me and come back next week when we delve into another story.